Hello everyone um, and thank you very much for joining us for uh, the last of this year's Toolkits Poetry Live podcast, which is very sad, but it's been a really great season. Um, I'm joining you today from the Wheeler Centre based in Nam, and Kelly is tuning in from Wollongong. So I would like to acknowledge the Darawal people as the traditional custodians uh, of the land from which Curly is broadcasting from, and for me, the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nations. Uh, this is also a country that I have the privilege to work, live and play on. This is land that was stolen and land that has been cared for by First Nations people since time immemorial. Uh, it is important that we move across this place with great care and respect, that we take time to sit with it, listen to it and protect it that we recognise the knowledge of this land's first peoples and crucially, crucially that we acknowledge that the violence of colonialism is not only historical but ongoing. Uh, in doing this, I also ask that you all acknowledge the land from which you are tuning in from and that you take the time to learn its histories and to listen to its many voices. Uh, so my name is Melody Paloma and I'm the facilitator of Toolkits Poetry, a program run by Express Media and Australian Poetry. For those of you who aren't familiar, Toolkits is an online intensive 12-week program for writers under 30. Uh, and it provides one-on-one -on -one mentorship to guide young writers through the development of new work alongside a series of workshops and presentations, some of which are broadcast live. Express Media are an organisation focused on the development of young writers. They produce brilliant programs like Tracks and uh, VoiceWorks, the quarterly literary journal for writers under 25. And Australian Poetry is the peak body for poetry in Australia. They produce a national festival program as well as a suite of publications. And I really encourage you all to get involved with Express Media and Australian Poetry in whatever way you can. Check out their websites and subscribe to Australian Poetry Journal and uh, VoiceWorks if you can. Our Toolkits is made possible by our generous funders, the Copyright Agency Cultural Fund, and Toolkits Live is presented by Express Media in partnership with Regional Arts Victoria as part of the Arts Connect series funded by the Federal Government's Regional Arts Fund. So tonight we're very lucky to be joined by the wonderful Curly Saunders, who will be speaking on the subject, Truth Speaking, Decolonising and First Nations Languages. Curly Saunders is a proud Ghana woman. She is an international children's author, poet, emerging playwright and artist. Curly manages poetry in first languages and poetic learning at Road River and Poetry, which you should check out. It's a great um, program. Her picture books include CBCA nominated and internationally published The Incredible Freedom Machines and forthcoming Our Dreaming and Happy Ever After and Afloat. A poetry collection, which is this beautiful book right here, um, is called Kindred and was highly commended in Black and White 2018. She was runner-up in the Nakata Brophy Prize in 2018. <laughs> uh, in 2019, you can find Curly at NT Writers Festival, Queensland Poetry Festival, Sydney Writers Festival, and as a writer in residence at the Literature Centre in Fremantle. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Curly now, who's going to talk to you all for around. 40 minutes and I'll jump off um, screen and mute my mic and then I'll come back on at the end for a little bit of a Q&A, Q &A, um, Q &A, -A -A. Um, <laughs> please tweet us your questions if you have them using the hashtag EM Toolkits. Okay, thanks very much Kelly, I'll pass over to you. Thank you so much Melody, um, Express Media and having it's a real pleasure. Um, to get to connect with everybody. Uh, hello and thank you for your time this, this evening. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge country and pay my respect to ancestors on Darawa land um, based out of Port Kembla tonight on the south coast of New South Wales. And um, I'd like to pay my respect to their saltwater dreaming, um, the sandstone here, which carries stories. Um, to acknowledge that uh, the house that I'm sitting in the moment, we've just renovated these walls. And um, while we were renovating, we um, I, I took the time to sit and really listen to a lot of stories and um, to hear the history of this land and um, echoing melodies there, prompt to go and um, find out the history of the lands that you're on. My family are Gunai people. Uh, we've got ties down to the mission um, down on Gunai country there around Bamiyanda. And then my mother's country, Biga, Yuan, um, she was born there and then removed from there and um, taken as a state ward in children's homes 
up to Gunungara country where I was born. And then on my grandfather's side, we're Biripai people, Russell's up that way, um, and then raised on the mission there, Lapurus, on Gadigal country. So I've got lots of different languages um, that I'm learning, lots of different culture, lots of different stories that I'm trying to piece together um, and understand. And um, yeah, I, I welcome you on that journey with me. It's an exciting time to be connecting. Um, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about poetry in first languages, a program that I lead. Um, and I'm also going to talk with you a little bit more about um, So um, at the end, we're going to have some time for questions. And in the meantime, sit tight and uh, thank you for your time. So I work for Red Room Poetry. I manage their education programs, their poetic learning programs. And I also manage their uh, Poetry in First Languages project, um, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later. If you check out Red Room Poetry, then I very much encourage you to do so. The artworks for this um, moment have been done by Rihanna Lutter, um, and they're two really incredible First Nations artists. Uh, so, poetry is one creative expression in my life, but I have many. Um, I, I love to paint, I love to draw, um, and poetry has lent itself. Um, really nicely to those things within my lifetime. So The Incredible Freedom Machines is my first picture book. It was um, born out of a motorcycle ride. I was riding my Ducati Monster 659 uh, along the east coast of New I fell really in love with motorbiking and um, at the time I was moving through anxiety and depression and I thought it was really important to try and reconnect to something that brings me a lot of joy. And I sat down on this motorcycle ride, so in love with my beautiful machine, and um, yeah, penned this beautiful poem. Uh, with that, I approached Ali, who's a really incredible illustrator, and um, yeah, and and then he he went on to illustrate a book. So from that, um, I think we can all learn that. If we have a passion to write, if we have a dream to write, um, then reaching out, connecting with other really incredible writers is a really great way to develop your skill set, to make some powerful connections that can lead to publishing. And um, if you have any questions about that, that process, please reach out. Uh, a lot of my poems have since been stretched into other picture books, so you'll get to hear um, what you can find out more on my website. Um, Curly Saunders, if you if you Google my WordPress, it'll pop up. And uh, there's lots of detail there about the different stories that I'm sharing through poetry and that, how they've been turned into picture books. I also publish work on Medium, so they're another blog um, program platform. And there's a few outlines there for how you can take your your publishing in the in the direction of, of um, being published with a, a broader publishing country uh, company if that's something you're interested in. Um, outside of writing poems, sometimes I can't find the words for poems, and uh, so I really love to paint. Um, and lately, I've been sitting with bigger canvases and starting to explore. Um, it's starting to explore visual poetry, and my next. Creative endeavors are to, to really go down that visual poetry pathway. So sometimes I can't find the words for poems, and that's when I bake, that's when I love to paint, uh, it's when I love to play music, I love my guitar. So I encourage you if you're a writer, if you're interested in being a writer and you can't find those words, to try and think about your creative expressions elsewhere. Just going to bring that slide back up and keep talking to that for a moment. So some of my poems have been published in uh, large scale public. Arts collaborations with Red Room Poetry in the Royal Botanical Garden. So if you're down in Melbourne, please go check out um, the poetic installation in the information centre there. On the bottom left, you can see um, poems that have been published with aquaphilic paint if you move around Adelaide. And uh, it's super exciting. One thing that Red Room does well, one thing that lots of publishing houses are doing really well now is taking poetry, taking writing, and um, amplifying that in really exciting, visible ways to bring poetry into um, and to connect people to poetry in a really meaningful way. And, um, yeah, I'm loving seeing those outcomes. The Incredible Freedom is published in Russia, Turkey, Western Armenia, 
um, Canada as well as English now. And another iteration of it is a performance with the Western Australian Symphony Orchestra, so you can see the score in the centre down the bottom there. Um, and we, I, I travelled around WA, Perth and Fremantle earlier in the year um, and over to Cocos Island and Christmas Island to tour this work. And it's a composition created by Matt Otley um, and his, yeah, very really incredible um, he's a really incredible team of musicians that he works with with Western Australian Symphony Orchestra. So there's an animation at the same time as um, the music playing that I'm very at the top. I wanted to bring a, share a little offering before I move into poetry and first languages. Um, this collection, Kindred, has been written over probably about six years. The poetry collection is broken into three parts. Um, so the first part being Mother, second part, third child, and the third part, lover. Um, mother is all about reconnecting to country, to culture, uh, and understanding the disconnection and inter intergenerational traumas in my family and the healing of those um, is evident in Earth Child. And then that final section is lover. Um, tonight is the University of Canberra Poetry Prize is being um, announced and um, one of my poems I would have loved to share there. So I wanted to share that poem with you first and then I'll read some poems from Kindred. This poem is for our grannies. Um, it's called Black Cars and there's a Gunungara partial translation in this collection, um, in this poem. And it's been supported by Ani Trish Levitt and Ani Zalman Noke up around the Southern Highlands there. Nya Gamiri, the Buringili of you, stand by the door frame next to ashen bucket filled with white soot. The dust on thin tips and apron, signs of the blessing smooth over faces to ward off black cars. They will not see you today. Now sense the Tuluan bank on phantom toes like breadcrumbs, guides to map you back to the places that Kujigawa hidden. These remnants as offering to deter black cars. They will not find you today. Nyangamiri, your outline, guwak over shoulder before issuing card table lessons, a curriculum in Gamuang Piala for Gujiga underfoot. This ritual of salt eyes over shoulders, a spell to impede black cars. They will not take you today. Now witness your shadows peel back the corners of drapes and sleep with one eye open, the door always ajar. These ancient omens to eradicate black cars. You are safe. Nyagamiri, your presence in careful mothers, hear your voice in Dewey Piala sons, your buringiling lives in Viri that will march against a government that once issued the collection of Gujiga in black cars. Always a step ahead. Um, this poem talks about the ghosts of our grandmothers, the dust of ash on fingertip and apron, um, checking through gaps in court curtains, hiding children in riverbanks. All of these, um, these nods to our, our grannies have been told to me by friends or by family. And so many of my experiences in writing come from life experience, from conversation, from witnessing things of my own. And um, this poem particularly is important um, because my grandma's one of my favorite, one of the favorite people for my mom. And when she was removed, she said she really missed her grandmother. Um, and our grannies have done such a job, such a good job of keeping kids safe from being taken. Those black cars are very on the cut. Um, so I think sharing stories like this through poetry, that decolonial um, push in our writing is really important. And um, a lot of kindred has been, has been that. So the next poem I'm going to read for you was born on the banks of the Shoalhaven River. I could hear the sounds of ancestors singing and I wanted to know what they were saying. And I called Aunty Trish and said, Aunt, I can hear voices. <laughs> I think I'm going crazy. And um, she said, no, girls, definitely not going crazy. What are they saying? And I said, well, I'm not really sure because it's all in language. And she said, well, that's what they're saying. It's time to go and learn language. So um, I wrote this poem and then she helped me translate it in language. And from there, we developed poetry in first languages. So uh, this poem, Disconnection, in some way is a catalyst. And I'm excited to share it with you now. Kujiga, nya gamiri nya ini mundu, empty spaces for gamuang words to fill and stretch your guri for the piala and their voices. 
Nya Garmiri, your trembling limbs ache to shake in Tangara and hear your lungs as they gasp Yungomba. Nya feel your body, sans Buringiling, Yabun and secret, and know that it has been grown with roots wrenched from the Da'auri that cradled them. And Nya taste the hunger, Nya Miri do, to know the parts of yourself, to feel your wang when your dewey has been taken. Little one, I see you mouth empty spaces for a mother's words to fill and stretch your ears for the stories and their voices. I watch your trembling limbs ache to shake in dance and hear your lungs as they gasp with songs unknown. I feel your body, sans spirit, ceremony and secret and know that it has been grown with roots wrenched from the earth that cradled you. And I taste the hunger you do to know the parts of yourself, to feel at home when your dreaming has been taken. Um, I'm going to read a few more poems from Kindred and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Poetry in First Languages, the project that developed from that experience. Because I'm on Darawal country, I'd love to share this one. Um, this is my apologies. And it was written on Darawal country with Darawal translation, translations informed by Ani Jodi Edward. When I walked with Ani Jodi on country, she told me that um, her and Jacob Morris, like you're being a Darawal custodian, um, had told me that if we want to, if we want the earth to respond to us, then we have to call everything by its right name. My apologies. I scoop you up in my hands and hold you tenderly with tear-stained cheeks as I recite a monologue of apology on behalf of anyone that has ever branded you with a name that isn't yours, that has ever called you earth, Sand, sun, sea, salt water, escarpment, fish, moon, bird, tree. Here you are Nuru, Widjud Widjud, Wuri, Garu, Palanjang, Marigong, Mara, Jajun, Wujang, Gudu. I also want to read another poem about Darawal country. This one was penned. Um, up around Campbelltown and around Appen, there's been a, a great big mass forest, as there has on so many of our lands. And it's really picturesque country. It's super beautiful, this gorge where we were sitting near the site. And if you didn't know the history, you'd be so caught up in the beauty of it. So I, I wrote a poem to bring people back to the history of the land, the truth of the land that we sometimes miss when we're getting caught up in uh, the glamour of our landscape. Darwell country. Bark like hanging noose, gum nut widow maker, water enough to drown in. There is trauma here. Wasp nest with spider skeleton, ants like homicide crime scene cleaners, windows barred, new trees, old scars. There is trauma here. Wilderness fenced, cicada brooches pinned to rough flesh, bloody sap leak secrets. There is trauma here. Ashen limbs ache to heal, shattered sky threatens to fall. Time in place of eucalypt. There is trauma here. I'm going to read one more poem. The last section of this collection is uh, Kindred is all about um, community and ties to community and um, people who have brought us healing or taught me along my way, along my journey. One of those people is a dear friend of mine, Naomi, who's a really beautiful Gomilaro singer, songwriter um, and teacher. And when I sat down to write this poem, Naomi had just moved from Sydney to Melbourne and I was thinking about how landscape holds memory, not just in the sense of the history of the place, but also memories of people. Um, so this poem is this city in Sydney and non I hope you're listening. You are a yellow bike needing glib pathways, the block in tree pose and the ukulele hands cradling in old fashioned at the Everly. The spots of a dress that belly laugh down Spice Alley, smooth single O on York and stories from foe bubbling at the galleries. You are Newtown green tea poured for dumplings, late nights at the Enmore and Horden and a 1950s cover anytime. Um, so I'm going to run you through poetry in first languages now, which is a 
project it's been a really great learning curve in how to celebrate first nations cultures first nations languages um through poetry and to celebrate and share and preserve those cultural um pieces yeah with elders and custodians on country so if you want to check out more jump on the red room poetry red check out poetry in first languages um and you'll be able to see a little bit more about the breadth of this program. It's delivered in 35 workshops, so we commissioned there's sort of three three arms to the program. Um, just going to bring you back. So there's sort of three three arms to the program. The first is that we commission First Nations poets to go out on country and to sit with their elders and custodians and to learn language. And um, that is a really wholesome grounding experience having done that one myself and that's I guess the origin of the program for me was to find ways to support other poets to learn language in the way that I wanted to. My mum as I mentioned was raised off country as a state ward in children's times and so we weren't raised with language, we weren't raised um, with explicit teaching and around culture and country and um, I always felt a longing for language and for the words to be able to describe myself or um, to communicate with the land and um, with community. So that's that first element. And a lot of the poems for poetry in first languages have been published online and will continue to be published on the Red Room Poetry website. So if you have any questions, jump on the Red Room Poetry website, shoot me a message that way, um, and check out Poets While You're There. The Poetry Library is really useful. And uh, yeah, go, go listen to, um, Go see Ethan Bell's work, go see Nicole Smead's work, check out Janine Lean, um, so many powerful, powerful poets, Paul Collis, Nick uh, Payton, yeah, really, really beautiful, beautiful stories, um, all, all recorded on them. So that's one element, I guess. The second element is to see our poets paired with custodians and elders on country to work with students in community. And so they'll go into workshops and in most instances we try and partner with some kind of environmental organisation like the Department of Planning, Environment and Industry. Um, and hello, Simon and Lorraine, if you're listening. Um, they do really wonderful things in language and land conservation. And three projects that we've been working with them or we will work with them on are uh, the Glossy Black Copper 2 um, protection and, and conservation strategy and then the strategy for the ice hole, the waterways down around Wollaga on new and country there and also the shorebirds on Jared country. So these projects will bring students together for one cultural community day where they get to meet with other elders and custodians, learn about um, bush medicine, bush tucker, fire, uh, contemporary care for country, traditional care for country and all of those practices, dance, art, um, cultural artifacts, so tools. Um, then they'll also get to learn language. And in the days that follow, we'll go out to schools or have students back at that same community space and we'll have them sitting with their elders and custodians and with poets to write songs and poetry. And then from there, we go on to publish those poems in really beautiful ways. So we publish them on bus backs and trains and, um, oh, I'm so sorry, I haven't, I haven't included the photo. I will, if you jump on the Red Room Poetry website, you will find it. Um, yeah, so bus backs, trains, uh, kick cuts, we celebrate through our Poetic Moments program at Red Room Poetry, we celebrate all of those amplifications of students' works in really interesting ways. So um, it's, it's really wholesome to see kids learn their first language words and then to take those words and speak them and record them as poetry that we can publish online, but then to be able to share them in their own community at local community events, needle events and things like that. Um, it goes full circle. and. That does a lot in the way of being able to connect kids to their elders and community, but also to be able to bring non-First Nations people into language learning in really meaningful ways. Um, other parts of my advocacy have been around, I'm just going to share my screen again. Sorry to keep doing this back and forth. Uh, working with, with other women, doing really powerful things with other women. This photo was taken on International Women's Day at a, a powerhouse panel with so many incredible people in my local community. The incredible Freedom Machines follows the story of a young girl. The entire story, the reason being that we would love for her to represent um, just one, one girl in community who comes from, well, many, many girls who come from uh, lower socioeconomic or 
stasis, status and places or poverty. Um, and at the end of the story, we see that if you haven't read it, this girl is reading her book um, and her book has been her way of overcoming poverty. So I love working to support girls, particularly young girls, um, to feel empowered to live and, and dream and do whatever it is that they want to do. Um, and also all, all genders, particularly, but particularly girls, have been um, sort of my main focus in, in school for me to help young people to know their personal power. Um, if you have any questions, they're going to start coming through now. And um, in the meantime, I just wanted to bring up some learning um, from the project, the Poetry in First Languages project. So, um, excuse me a moment while I just bring up that screen. Sorry, it's just taking um, so there you can see some of the different publications that we've had with the project. Um, on the left hand side there, the Tumble on Gatherers program saw us publish poems from our commissioned poets on these really beautiful lines. And the city, and then we had Joel Davis, the organical poet, and I performing poems in language. Um, check that one out on the Red Room Poetry website. Victoria um, was eight years old when her poem was published on the back of a bus, and it meant that her poem drove around for about six years and people got to learn three different parallel language words. And um, yeah, seeing her face when we go up with this great big bus, up the top on the right hand side there, you can see another of our students, one of our NASCAR kids. So we partner with the National Association um, Chance. Association, I def definitely recommend you check them out. And um, here a student is, has her poem going through the water with an artist, Alan Giddy's interpretation through flow. Um, this one was done in the Royal Botanical Garden. So if she has a stick to her ears, she could hear the sound of her poem flowing, flowing through the water. And those publication outcomes, yeah, go, you know, reach and then finds its way into the ears of many, many people. But also it means that students get to have a really cool publishing outcome. Here's some from this year's um, Black Copper 2, the Garrel Conservation Project on Gunungara country where we partnered with Winter Caribbean Council and the Department of Planning, Industry and Environment. So, Online as well, and as I say that grace to the right there will be one of our emerging poets through the program for next year, and that's one really, a really powerful part of the program in my eyes. That lots of our emerging poets get to be mentored and supported to develop their own language, um, and also to be to sculpt themselves as emerging poets. So this year we've delivered programs on all of these, all of these spaces um, and uh, it's, it's been a huge year of Indigenous languages, partnering with different organisations, working with lots of elders um, and lots of elders and custodians to work with community and to try and support our young people in languages. The impacts of the program were assessed by the Indian group and this year are being assessed by um, or researched by Eleanor Carlos at the University of Technology be able to, to share those with you soon. But you can see the impacts of the project. That overwhelming majority of participants reported positive experience with the program and that for many of them, this was their very, very first access to a language program within schools. So I know that was my experience not being able to access language and poetry as a means to be able to access language and self-express is a really powerful thing. It's exciting to see um, those parts programs being our means for shaping the curriculum in, in new ways. Um, that confidence and deeper firm is, um, you know, something that I, I love to see in the program and I see it often. Our young people leaving the program just feeling a little bit more confident and sending it to a little bit more proud and our elders and custodians feeling like they're sharing their knowledge with the next generation.
Um, so I guess I guess that's it for uh, poetry in first languages. If you want to find out more, please jump on the Red Room Poetry website and you can see the way that poems have transpired in my life to be able to support um, young people and lots of First Nations communities to be employed to teach language um, or have the opportunity to learn language and to share language through poetry in lots of really, really meaningful ways, trains, kick cuffs, bus, bus backs, um, yeah, as well as online. When you're on the Red Room Poetry website, make sure you check out the poems up there as well um, and, and go read yourself some poetry. Um, and then I suppose outside of Red Room, um, I I spoke a little bit before about my first picture book, The Incredible Freedom Machines. Um, it's a story of that books are our freedom machines, that they allow us to travel all around the world and stay in one place, um, to meet people we've never met before, to go into the past and the present and the future, and that they unlock all sorts of doors um, and can help us end poverty. So The Freedom Machines has been shortlisted for the Prime Minister's Literary Award. So next Wednesday I'll be at Parliament House, um, fingers crossed. Hopefully, looking across the big stage, meeting some big important people, um, and that's the, the very first of, of my books. After there, I guess I, I was nineteen when I started writing seriously and with intention, and every day I would sit down to write. Um, and then beyond that, um, the, the, beyond the freedom machines, it was just that continual process of writing every day. So if you're a, a writer and um, you know, you're starting out for the first time, I very much encourage that practice, writing every day, just showing up, letting the words flow through you, writing your surface um, as a stream of consciousness to figure out where you're up to and, um, and then picking out the little golden bits and flowing with those and following them in directions. And sometimes they'll turn into poems or, or stories or uh, plays, and sometimes they'll be painted into pictures because you won't be able to find the words. Um, the next stories to come out, the, in picture books land for me are Our Dreaming, which talks about the Ewan Gungara dreaming that was told to me. Um, and the dreaming, um, how, how that shapes our, our ways of being and knowing. So I'm really excited to share that one. It's being illustrated by Doug Leffler, um, a really incredible illustrator, First Nations illustrator. If you haven't seen his work, make sure you check him out. Um, Happy Ever After, I can't announce who the illustrators are yet, but I love them. Um, it tells the story of my mum being taken from country and that experience of being told that you, you can't cry and you can't miss your community. And um, when I first showed this to publishers, they said, this was really haunting. Um, are you sure that this is the story you want to share? Um, and I think sharing those stories goes a long way in undoing the cultural narratives and the stereotypes that we've been told. I know I was raised in the 90s with a stereotypical history and um, it was very white and I really longed for truth because what I was seeing and what was being told to me were very different things. So I hope that stories like that go into the classroom and begin to, um, yeah, hold a little more truth for our, in our history, our nation's history and to um, share First Nations voices with pride um, and honesty. And I think, yeah, that's that's an exciting, it's an exciting time in publishing, I think. We're going a long way about doing that. And then uh, I won the Daisy Udamara Award. So with Magabala, I've been working on my verse novel. Um, it's called Mother Speaks and Grace Lucas Pennington is helping me edit it. Hi, Grace. It's, um, it's an exciting, it's an exciting project to be working on because verse novels aren't my first choice of uh, novel, but, and I've never written a novel. But that process of taking poetry and, and tying together narrative in a more succinct way and being really experimental with it has been really fun so far. So that one will be out in 2021. Um, I, I guess I wanted to speak mostly to truth speaking with being on here and I hope I haven't been too random. I've had all of these ideas floating around today. Um, and I guess that comes back to the dreaming for me. So when I spoke about the dreaming being those Ewan and Gunagara dreams that were told to me. Um, the dreaming for me hasn't just been, um, you know, creation stories. It's been purpose and responsibility to your community and yourself. And I've been told that um, there's, there's three parts to it. And the first is to make sure you take care of yourself so you can share with community. The second is to take care of Mother Earth. Um, we're born from her, we return to her, that idea of sustainability and care for the things that can't speak is really integral um, and that awareness that there is no hierarchy between plants and animals and people. We're all on the same level. And um, the reincarnation practice of spirits being returned and 
or all kinds of living things um, means that you know, we must care for Mother Earth. And the third part is to share your gift with community. And um, as a writer, when I asked the elders about this, I said, oh, I'm a bit stuck. What do I do? You know, I'm, I'm teaching at the moment, but I love writing stories. And they said, well, you're the storyteller. Go and tell the stories. Go and teach and bring young people into your learning that way. And um, I guess my truth speaking then has been writing. And if your truth speaking is, is you writing or you painting or playing music, whatever it is, I really encourage you to pursue that and share your gift with community um, in really meaningful ways. And I think the more that we engage with First Nations communities to do this and the more that we all pursue that within ourselves, the stronger um, we, we become as a collective people. Um, outside of those practices, in, and I guess that's been the last couple of years have been, I keep talking about decolonising, I mean removing the identity that's been told to me stereotypically um, or those expectations of what I should be as a First Nations person or, um, as, you know, as someone who's colonised and coloniser, I'm, I'm both of those things in my family. Um, and I think writing for me has been that self decolonial practice that Pocolo Nui talks about it recommend you check out his work too, um, that process of decolonizing, of um, questioning the entire identity that's been told to you and wondering if you agree with that or if you want to rewrite it and what does that look like and how can you bring back um, First Nations or traditional ways of being annoying into your life. And when I'm writing every day, I feel like I'm doing that. When I'm connecting with elders and custodians and community to share language and culture with kids, I feel like I'm doing that and um, I urge you to find ways to support your local community to do the same thing. Um, on an organisation and arts level, uh, I think we're decolonising widely too and, and truth speaking in the way that, especially at Red Room, we, um, when, I, when I came on board, we updated our RAP, we got a reconciliation action plan, we developed a First Nations cultural advisory board. We're pushing to get First Nations representation on our board. Um, we have a First Nations editor, an incredible one, Janine Lean, uh, really wonderful Wiradjuri writer. And um, Janine has been helping us to edit and support our First Nations writers in their commissioned pieces. So um, there's that organisational shift towards rewriting the arts to be more culturally respectful and responsible. And uh, I think it's a, a really exciting time to be writing and to be celebrating in the arts more broadly. I think we're going to throw to questions very soon. Um, Thanks so much, Curly. Um, that was really beautiful. Um, and it's really I'm sorry. No, sorry. Read so much of your work as well. Yeah, thank you very much. If you have any um, questions to clarify any of those things that I spoke about, please just let me know and I'll, yeah, I'll explain them that. Yeah, we, we have had a couple of questions come through on Twitter and please, um, anyone else, please do tweet your questions and you can use the hashtag EM Toolkits. Um, so the first um, asks what poets and writers um, specifically inspire your work? Uh, I think everybody should read Ali Kobe Ekerman. Um, she would be one of my huge big inspirations and I feel really lucky working at Red Room Poetry, I get to see so many amazing writers so if you get stuck particularly australian writers um jump on to the red room poetry poetry library um and I, I have daily inspiration there um beyond beyond ali i really love alison whittaker's work so black work is really beautiful also recently short shortlisted for the pm lit awards um congrats alison um tara june winch her book the yield is oh, so powerful, you know, we've got some really amazing First Nations writers, um, particularly bubbling away on the scenes, doing really incredible things. And we stand on the shoulders of some really powerful First Nations writers who have paid the scene for us too. So um, shout out to all of those wonderful ancestral spirits and, and current um, more senior writers within our writing circle, those Lionel Fogarty's, um, those Ujiri and Knuckles, yeah. We're really lucky, I think. Yes, so much beautiful, um, rich writing there. Um, and, and, yeah, everyone, please do go and check out Red Room's website and specifically the Poetry in First Languages project. Um, we've got one more question on, on Twitter at the moment, uh, and I think it's an important one. Um, what cultural sensitivities is it, 
helpful to be aware of when using texts like Kindred and other First Nations literature in our classrooms? That's a really good question, thank you. Um, I think to acknowledge where the text was derived from is always really, really powerful. So um, when, you're, when you're picking up a, a piece of literature written by a First Nations writer, familiarising yourself with their origin, their background, their language groups um, is a really great place to start. And then I would start digging around about the broader context context of the of the book that you're reading so um, there's heaps of reviews online lots of interviews of writers about their works um, for kindred it's broken into three segments it was written predominantly on darawal country um, but also around um, tasmania as i as i edited it through there um, gunungara country where i was born and gandigal country where i was working in sydney so um, those cultural those those country constructs and having that awareness context for um, your teaching is powerful. Then beyond that, um, understanding the ways that stories carry either healing or trauma, I think is a really powerful one. So a lot of the stories and the poems within this collection, Kindred, are talking about very raw and very real and very painful, powerful things. So Sacred Spaces 1 and 2 um, is written about sacred places and their role in healing intergenerational traumas and, and pains. Um, Darawal Country is written about um, yeah the, the the massacres that happen within that space. Um, my apologies, features language. I think um, when you're picking up poems featuring language, it's always really supportive or powerful or endorsing in a way if they have uh, the language that the poem is written in, but also a translation supporting or a, a note to say which elder or custodian has helped in the translation of that text. Um, so I definitely keep an eye out for those things. Beyond that, I think the always best practice would be to get that author or poet or writer in your classroom or shoot them an email and just say, hey, I'd love to share this poem. Do you have a backstory for it? Or is there anything we should be aware of when we're teaching this? Um, and I think always coming to sharing those texts in a place that's safe for those texts to be shared. So starting off with an acknowledgement of country, starting off with um, you know, a welcome or whatever is appropriate and just saying, hey, the things that we're going to speak about today are true and real and have happened. And um, if you, you know, those safer spaces, if you need to self-care, please do stop. If you need to reach out to me afterwards, let me know. If you want to ask questions, please do so respectfully. There's some really great pointers um, for teaching texts early. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, I think it's really important um, that we all keep in mind that, you know, learning institutions have historically and often still haven't been safe safe spaces for um, uh, First Nations people. Um, so I've just got one more question on Twitter. What advice do you have, oh, sorry. What advice do you have for, stu for students, teachers and school leaders who want to go about decolonizing our school curriculum? Well, where do you begin? Um, <laughs> well, I guess the first thing I would start with doing would be to understand the cultural and historical, political um, and land um, history that you're for the, for the land and the space that you're in. Um, and that context is really helpful then in understanding what needs to be acknowledged. Because I think one of the first stages for, for decolonizing in the education space is being really honest about the things that have happened on our landscape and, um, yeah, Go, go and dig deep, read some books, have conversations with local historians, talk to your local elders and custodians, if appropriate, and if that feels safe. Um, once you have a bit of an understanding of context, I'd recommend reaching out to your local community with the offering of, we would love to work with you on this. Um, are you available, interested, you know, and is that something you'd like to be a part of? And the reason I say with the offering is because um, it can feel sometimes, and I, I have this regularly, people will say, oh, hey, can you tell me the answer to this thing? And I'm like, oh. The assumption that you have that I know culturally the answer to that, um, it, it forgets that my family were raised as state wards in children's homes or were raised on missions and that language or culture or that learning hasn't been passed down to me. So, um, and, and often there's a lot of pain tied or shame associated with that not knowing or the um, unwillingness to share because we've lost so much. And so I think the offering is a really good way to go about it. 
Um, beyond that, I would say question everything. Look at all of the structures that are in, in place and ask where did those structures come from? Because lots of our system structures have been um, told to us they're based on imperial systems or colonial systems. Um, our whole school system is that. You know, um, so I would say that would be a really big one. And also get outside, um, connecting to the earth. earth. Mother Earth has always been our teacher. Spending time outside has always been a really powerful place of grounding and reconnecting and listening and learning. And I think that's a, another really important facet. And uh, one other tip would be that deep listening, making sure that we are taking time to hear each other um, and to hear the things that bubble beneath the story on the top. Um, like like the, the sea that looks calm, there's lots of going underneath the surface there, so making sure that we're listening deeply. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I'm wondering, I've heard you speak before um, and write about um, learning languages having a huge impact on well-being and connection to country, um, but I'm also wondering about how um, being able to speak and write in language has uh, change your relationship to poetry as well. Yeah, yeah. well, I think uh, language is such a lyrical, uh, First Nations languages are such lyrical languages and they sound melodic and they sound like music. And so writing with them feels like songwriting. It's a really, really special, um, really special practice being able to tie language into your work. I also love that it's super collaborative, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there often and I'll shoot a text or give a call to or sit on country and have a cup of tea with an elder or custodian and I'll say, hey, can you tell me about this thing or I want to know the word for this, can you teach it to me or um, can you remind me how to wrap my, my mouth around that word again because I'm remembering it, you know, you're helping me to remember. So um, those are really beautiful things. I think beyond that, learning language has given me words to describe myself that I didn't have. And it's allowed me, so my family are, are Gunai people, but I've been raised on Gunagara country. So raised in New South Wales, family as far back as we know of Gunai people around Victoria. Um, and then with people, family being raised on missions, there's also been um, a disconnect from knowing exactly where we came from before the mission. Um, and so I've often felt like I'm off country or I'm not connected or um, that it's not the right place for me to learn that kind of cultural knowledge or language. And so learning a language is something we can do anywhere that we go if we take the time to listen and if we take the time to connect. And it feels like a very grounding practice and a very respectful and honouring practice to say, um, hey, ancestral spirit, hey, um, elders or hey, community, I want to know um, and I want to I wanna pay homage to um, the powers that are here and the I want to connect to the landscape here. Can you tell me more about this? Yeah. Um, thanks, Kelly. Would you be able to talk a little bit about um, why it's important as well um, that people aren't expecting translations all the time as well when, when um, First Nation poets are choosing to use language, that there shouldn't always be this expectation to, to have the translations that... Um, I think, it, and it's something we're seeing more and more often, and it's so exciting. And uh, you know, there's there's playwrights, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the name, but people who are um, writing plays entirely in language, and you you sit there in the audience and you look at playwrights and go, whoa, this play is entirely in language, and I feel alienated from it or separate from it. Um, from what I know, I, I think it's a really big reclaim. I think it's one of those, um, you know, I've been forced to speak English my whole life and I wanted to speak language and I wanted to um, to feel that kind of connection and here I have been in this alienated space of um, not being mm -hmm. the dominant cultural dominant language or the dominant narrative um, and so if we can position our audience to feel the same then there's an awareness that's raised there by having language without translation. Um, I think also some, and I'll find sometimes um, an elder or a custodian will, there'll be cultural knowledge that can't be shared. So a translation will give away things that we're not able to give away. So we won't share those things. Um, and sometimes there won't be um, direct translation as well. There's there's a lot of complexities between translation more broadly, but um, in First Nations communities, in a lot of ways, it's it's holding on to things and keeping them safe because um, so much has been taken or lost or not cared for in the right way. So it's just it's holding on to things and also um, yeah, a allowing for the audience to feel like um, that sense of alienation that we've felt so many times. 
Yeah, something um, that has been illuminated for me through um, reading um, work from uh, Indigenous poets as well who, who use language is that a return to language um, can also be something that is painful. Um, I think of work from like Alison Whitaker, um, particularly her poem Sharp Tongue, um, which uh, uses a, it's in her first book, Lemons and Chicken Wire, and she has a receipt um, for a, a Camilla Rowe to English um, dictionary um, and the poem, um, part of the poem next to it with lines like, um, speaking this noisy wound will burst. And I think that seems like something that's important to keep in mind as well. Yeah, for sure. And, and I definitely encourage everybody, go and read Alison Burke. It's so powerful, it's so beautiful, it's so awesome and it's yeah, really necessary work. Um, I wanted to ask you about your book as well, particularly this um, first section, which um, you've read from, thank you so much, uh, called called Mother. And that, that the first poem is called Matriarchy, and you sort of touched on this earlier, um, that there's you know, such a strong group of Aboriginal women in Australian poetry um, who, you know, like I feel are really at the cold face, mm -hmm. doing so much of this work around interrogating colonial archives and the stories that have been told about First Nations people, um, which makes me think specifically of Janine Lane and her reference to Aboriginal women as gatherers. Um, mm -hmm. She's got a poem about this in um, Red Room's project, but um, also a paper called Gathering the Politics of Memory and Contemporary Aboriginal Women's Writing. Uh, and she talks about Aboriginal women not just being gatherers of physical things, but of memories, that their bodies are a kind of archive when memories are etched, storied and anchored. Um, does, this, does this speak to your practice, do you think? That first section of the book. Um, definitely, definitely. Um, I think I remember learning language and seeing with Jacob Morris, who was, um, we've commissioned his work as well, he's been kind of a poetry student for the year. Um, and Jacob was talking about how language is remembering. And um, I think that process of, of gathering language has been remembering things and the learning of language or the realisation of people not holding language and the shame that comes with that as well um, has led to lots of moments of remembering with lots of elders, custodians, aunts. And, um, yeah, the way that the, that the body holds those things as we move around the world, as we move around our lives. There's one um, poem in that first section called Auntie. And it was written for those that bear the scars of our past. Um, it starts off with, I press my fingertips to the scars of your forearm and trail the stitch marks as my eyes well. And you tell me that your insides aired themselves that day. That tissue saw sunlight for the first time when a canyon was carved into you by someone assigned to provide you care. Um, and I think, yeah, so, so many of the times that I've spent gathering in poetry and archives and sitting and listening, um, there's been very much a bodily experience and language brings us that bodily experience too. So often you know, I feel language in my body. I'm like, oh, this, this is where this place, this is where this word sits or this is where, um, this is the healing, this is the place where I feel the healing when I speak that word. Uh, I was wondering also about um, the use of Aboriginal English uh, in a lot of poetry um, by Indigenous poets. Um, and Ali Kobi Eckerman uh, in her HSC resource on Red Room's website, which is really amazing. I would encourage everyone to go and have a look at this. There's, there's videos of her reading her work as well as um, videos of the interviews with her um, and where she talks about her work and um, she talks. Uh, specifically about uh, using Aboriginal English and um, talking about the playfulness of that as being synonymous with, with poetry. And she said, I like writing the way I like talking um, and that this has been part of her healing. Um, yeah, I also love that resource um, and I direct teachers to it all the time. So if you're a teacher and you're listening, even if you're not a HSC teacher, please check it out. I think it will 
um, transcend your understanding of poetry, really help you to find some tangible resources that you can take into the classroom. Um, and I think Ali's so right in the way that she talks about Aboriginal English. I remember being a kid and being taught Aboriginal English words or or ling lingo words and not knowing that they were Aboriginal words because they were just part of our, our practice and later realising that I've, I've known language, even if I haven't known language in the way that I've been taught it as an adult, um, but I've known some of that along the way. And that has helped me in the way that we communicate with each other and that kind of, um, that narrative sort of and word play that comes in when you're working in colloquialisms and, and language. Um, and it's another reclaim too. You know, it's beautiful to see, you, I was taught poetry was about dead, written by dead white guys and that it was very structured. And so to be able to break away from that form and to have really incredible poets like Ali being using these um, Aboriginal language words, it's, it's really special. And I think it goes a long way to decolonizing our poetry again. Another thing that she talks about that I feel is really important in those interviews is um, that there needs to be uh, a removal of the, the onus um, being placed on um, Indigenous people to talk to talk about, um, to educate settler Australians, that there needs to be a drive and a curiosity among among settlers, which, which means, you know, reading work by um, Aboriginal authors and consuming work by Aboriginal artists. Um, and not just one, but uh, you know, a, a, a wide array and listening. Yeah, I, I love that. I think it was Eunice Andrada who sat me down. Uh, really incredible, really incredible Filipino poet check her work out. Um, and she was like, "Girls, people of color are not responsible for teaching people not of color about people of color." And it's like, oh, Eunice, that's so freeing. Thank you. <laughs> um, because, yeah, it, it can be really emotionally exhausting. And I think there's a space where hopefully I've, I've shared some knowledge today that um, helps you on your journey, First Nations or not, um, and, and hopefully it prompts you to go and, and read some more and check out these wonderful resources. Um, next year, Red Room Poetry and Magabala Books are partnering to deliver Guayu, which has been edited by Janine, um, and it's a collection of all of our First Nations poets across the last 10 years. So uh, that would be another really wonderful resource, bringing together all those beautiful poems, my featuring language, all of them First Nations stories and poems. Um, it's going to be really beautiful. Oh, amazing. Um, Janine did toolkits with us last year. And, uh, yeah, I'd encourage everyone to um, have, a, have a look at that video too. Um, thank you so much, Curly, um, for spending this evening with us. It's been really beautiful and, yeah, I really loved hearing you create your work as well. It's very powerful. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, and this is the last of our live broadcasts for poetry um, this year. Uh, so thanks everyone for watching and you can watch these back at any time and be back next year, hopefully. All right. Um, thank you, Fred Media and Australian Poetry. It's been so lovely. And thank you so much, everybody, for your time and for coming to this afternoon. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to sail them over to Red Room Poetry and I'll endeavour to get